thank you so much for joining me. Where in Australia are you? You're in Sydney? Sydney, yes. Yeah, I love, I, I'm so excited. I love the fact that I get to interview women of so many different ages and from so many different countries. Like I literally I have the best job in the world. I get so excited. Uh, so you're 25, correct? Yes, correct. <laughs> and um, why don't we start with kind of when you were diagnosed with ADHD and what was happening in your life at the moment that made you really start to think this could be ADHD? Yeah, I mean, much like yourself and, and everyone, it was like such a such a long journey. And, you know, <laughs> you get to a point where you're like, oh, that's what it was, you know, and, you know, and it's just been so inspiring listening to you and, and, and everyone on this podcast. But yeah, so when I realized I, I didn't even know what it was until my sister-in-law kind of came in the picture and said, have you got this? You know, like, and he, she didn't even come from a background in this or anything, but she had looked after children with autism and, you know, and the like. So she was like, you know, you're, you know, you're a growing 20 year old. What's, what's going on here? There's something going on there. Um, but anyway, the whole process was just pretty much my years of struggle with high function anxiety, getting diagnosed with PTSD, um, and then always feeling like there was another answer and just like, there's nothing, there's something that's not getting addressed here. You know, no matter how much all those psychi psychologist appointments was going and all, this, all the therapy and all the strategies they've given me, I'm like, there's still something I'm not addressing. Um, but yeah, and then it's funny because a coworker like two years ago had pointed out, like, oh, you touch your ear, your, your, your earlobe a lot. You rub your earlobe a lot. Um, I think that's your stim. And I'm like, what's a stim? Like, what is this? <laughs> what are you telling me? And, you know, then I went down that pathway and um, I'm like, I am no idea like i'm like okay well my brother twirls his hair and then you know and that just opened my eyes a lot more but um it was more so during covid that my um my sister-in-law kind of sent me this list um of autism traits in women and it was like you know just have a read like you know there's different types but just have a read and you know it doesn't have to apply to you but just let me know what you think i'm like okay and i remember just sitting down there reading this list and just freezing and just in, in shock and just, I just felt tears just stream out of my eyes, but it was just relief. And it was just also like sadness because it was just like, okay, someone's told me through a list. Like, how did I just not notice that before? Um, but no, it, it was great because then I was like, okay, well, okay, let's, let's figure this out. Well, what is this? So, um, and then eventually, you know, ask, asking my psychologist, like, you know, could this be ADHD that's presenting not just anxiety and PTSD? And she was pretty much saying like, you know, I think it's more just your anxiety. So you know, don't really focus too much on that. But if you want to have, give it a go, do it. I'm like, okay, fine. And then eventually, you know, COVID was a bit more crazier. And I was like, you know what? Well, I'm at home a lot. Let's really Let's really dig deep into this. And I found that there was this diagnostic center in Sydney um, that you could do like a pre-screen. So they pretty much give you this whole questionnaire and you just answer all these questions about your background, your medical background, all your history, any struggles that you might have had. Um, and then they get someone else to answer on your behalf as well and just kind of relay those um, experiences of what you felt and how they saw that through you. Um, and then I got it a week later and, and the um, neuropsychologist that wrote the whole assessment up said it's recommended that you get a full diagnostic, um, ADHD diagnostic um, assessment. And so, yeah, that's when I was like, okay, this is for real, um, let's let's do this. And then, so I went to my GP and then obviously got a referral. Um, and that also obviously took took a while. And I've heard other people on this podcast who have um, had quite some experience here that they've actually had a lesser wait time here than in most countries around the world. Um, I only really had a two month wait because my sister-in-law was like, well, have you actually chased them up? Because you sent the referral like two months ago. I'm like, ah, I'll, I'll have a look. And you know, that's something that you forget, right? Like it's just the time behind this and just there's so many things are hyper fixating on. So, and yeah. then eventually I called the um, clinic and they were like, well, yeah, we just received it. Do you want to book it? And I'm like, great, let's do it. Um, and it was funny because at that time I was, you know, was going to get married and they were like, so when is your next, when would you like to, to book it? And I said, oh, well, when's your next available appointment? And they said, well, November 15. And I said, cool, a week after I might get married, that's excellent, let's do it. And they were like, are you sure? Like, you're going to be in your honeymoon stage. I'm like, no, 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 this is more important. And my husband wants me to do this. And I want to do this. We need to look after ourselves. <laughs> let's do this. And they're like, that's great, do it. Um, but yeah, then went to the appointment and pretty much they were like, yeah, call your husband in. We're going to tell you both what's happening and you've got it. <laughs> so, um, 
but yeah, obviously within all that, it's, it's been a lot more to, to tell. So, um, yeah, <laughs> long journey. Oh, wow. Yeah. I know when you were talking about the, that grief and mm. elation and going back mm. and forth, like I, I often call it like, a, yeah. it feels like a game of, of shoots and ladders with <laughs> that feeling, right. Of, of feeling Absolutely. like, Oh my God, this is the greatest thing. This diagnosis is the greatest thing that's happened yeah. to me. Right. It's so much information. Oh. It's really tapping into who I am and, yeah. and how, you know, and it's so empowering and it's so yeah. wonderful. But then at the same time, you're like, Oh, you just get hit. Like my, you know, my heart will drop into mm. my stomach when I think about the life I could have lived or just, you know, all of the ways in which I struggle needlessly still after a That's diagnosis. Right. Um, mm. and, and how, you know, going back and forth between like the disorder side of it and the superpower side of it. Yeah, absolutely. But no, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I, but I think that's the greatest thing though, because then you can, that's where you're like, okay, well, that's a lot of learning and unlearning, you know, um, I mean, you're constantly growing. So it's, yeah, but it's, it's, it is, it's great. Um, I think everyone has that, uh, that moment after the diagnosis where, yeah, it's the relief, but uh, yeah, the sadness for the past few years and, and just how much you could have done. But then, you know, your psychiatrist, your psychiatrist just tells you, don't think that way, you know, think more progressively and, and look to the future and, and do, do what you can while you can. So I'm like, oh, that, yeah, great. Right? Cool. You can think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Or how many women are told by their medical provider, like, oh, it's, it's just anxiety, you know, like oh. you just need, you just need to have a nap or whatever they tell yeah. you, right? Uh, yeah. and it's like, you know, you I've need to lower so your expectations. Naps. No, that's right. Yeah. It's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, how many naps can I have until I'm really okay then? Like, I don't know. So, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Um, now you had mentioned the earlobes stimming, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, yeah. But what were some of the things after your diagnosis where you looked back over your life and childhood mm. where you were like, "Oh, the signs were there all along"? Yeah, um, I think I, I always questioned that because you know my mom was always like, "Well, that was like you just calming yourself down as a baby, like that what you always you know you looking on the bottle and you were just that was you." I'm like, okay. And then because I have a child, a, a childcare background, um, you know, I always watch these other children do the same and I'm like, okay, so that should be like, that's their thing as well. And, and, but you know, that wasn't the only thing. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, apart from my earlobes, I, I remember just constantly having phases, you know what they say, like, you know, but then obviously now I'm realizing that's hyper fixations and in, in, in bigger, bigger um, situations, like, you know, my, like how much I enjoyed musicals and just, no matter how many years ago it was that I'd seen this musical, I'm still listening to that to this day. And it's just like, why? Like, it's, it's amazing. Cause like you, you love it and you enjoy it. So it's like, you know, you just, you love, you just want to be in that moment all the time. But I think, and it's just, you know, obviously that's a whole positive side of that, but the RSDs is the biggest one that I've noticed is obviously the hugest part of, of ADHD that can knock down a lot of, of us. And, and it's still a, like a, I think to, to kind of learn how to, how to juggle and manage because it's, it's, you know, it's different for everyone and how it, um, how you do manage and how you can get through it. But it, I think that one really struck me because I'm like how I was having so much difficulty transitioning from a high school structure to then going into college and then dropping out of college because all the disorganization was there and, and yeah, and how much RSD I experienced because of, because of how different I had felt and, and just everything there. Um, but yeah, that, you know, definitely presented, um, how much ADHD really was there, but no one had really, um, I guess expressed that and pointed that out to me. Um, and another one was definitely, uh, my impulsivity. I mean, that's like a big one for us and like how much you dopamine seek, you know, and actually I recently learned, I'm not sure if it was on, uh, here or, or um, on a forum, uh, recently read, but it was like dopamine dressing. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of that term. Yes, that was, yeah. yes. Um, I've heard of it. I don't know if it was a guest to, yeah. or if it's the learned experience, um, yeah. learned experience educator on Instagram. She's amazing. Yeah, and possibly. I think she's actually Australian, um, oh, yeah, yeah. but she's, yeah. she's a, has a great account and she calls, she talks about dopamine dressing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. I think that realizing that it's like, well, no wonder I love pink and red so, so much. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm also super obsessed with like strawberries. So I think, you know, 
knowing that that was such like, it is my longest hyperfixation. Like it's not just a face, but that you know when people go, well, you're that type of girl. It's like, oh, it's because I've just loved this the rest of my whole life. Like it's not, yeah. So I don't know all that <laughs> combined. I th I think about those children who are like really into a certain animal or a certain animal yeah. print. You see their bedrooms and it's just <laughs> filled, right? With every single yeah. thing is covered in yeah. like cow print or, or, you know, pigs. And it's like, yeah. oh, well, huh, is this an early sign? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, well, you you had some difficulty in high school, right? I mean, mm. you, you were bullied quite mm. severely. Is that mm. right? Yes, correct. Um, um, do you yeah. look back through this lens of ADHD and think about sort of socially how that might have affected you and, and or especially with the RSD element, like how mm. you reacted to it? Because you you started um, self-harm at that point, too, correct? Yes, correct. Yes. Yeah, so it, you know, it it's weird because it, I think it's weird because a lot of it wasn't even how much I felt bad from the bullying it was more how I managed it and and how obviously it did affect me but just how much the rejection part of it and how sensitive I was that yeah I was like well that's the only option I have um but I obviously not knowing what it was then but it's just because our brain works that way that's just what I had to go off from um and even then like you know just growing up in the culture where like you know mental health stigma is just it's it's such a big thing and you know an Asian background um, whether it is growing up in Sydney but it was just that you know my parents grew up with the fact that well it, that stuff doesn't exist it's like you know you just you just look you know it, stuff happens to you trauma happens to you you just move on um and so you know I was always I grew up with the lens of just okay so well I don't know how to manage this it's like did they do the same so I, you know I, I just I suffered in silence and and that's the, the sad part about it and I think that's also with ADHD like just not knowing until really someone brings it up. Um, so, but yeah, with all the self-harm and that, I think mm. I, I was very lucky to have a cousin in the same grade during high school. Um, and she knew I was very depressed and, you know, you have all these moods and, and just, you know, everything that's all at once, especially in that, that very sensitive time that you're growing it, she just knew, I remember running to the bathroom and, and she'd followed me and ran, you know, and, and like, she knew I had scissors in my hands. I'm sorry if it's triggering anyone, but I, you know, it, she, she had to like push the stall down and just pretty much just said like, just stop and just start crying. And yeah. And I just still remember that to this day. Cause she just like, you know, you, you had so many of those because you just didn't know, you didn't know what it was. And I'm like, I, yeah, it, it, and if someone had told me that that was that, I, you know, I still don't know how I would have managed because no one was going to steer me in the right direction. Even the um, school counselor was just saying, you're just sad. That's just how you're dealing with it. You're just, mm. and I remember feeling so yeah. like, just, I just felt hurt when they said that. I'm like, so you're not going to help me. Oh, isn't that your job? Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah. With the whole bullying, I think, you know, I was always taught to, you know, stand my ground and, and be tough, but you know, I think it affected me more when other people were getting bullied. So I tried to step in for them and, and kind of guard them. And I did a couple of times. I mean, it got pretty violent, um, but not to the point where no one was bleeding. It was more like pushing bags and then, you know, all that. Cause it was, it was an old girls school. Mm. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, emotions are always at, at high and in, um, in a class full of girls. So <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, yeah, that's a theme we've talked about a lot throughout the podcast episodes about that increased empathy and the mm. like really, you know, intense drive for social justice and yeah. and protecting others. And I do, I think it comes from that feeling of, of mm. being, feel, you know, so many of us feel, felt very lonely and socially isolated and, yeah. and always feeling other and less than, yeah. you know, and so it's sort of, it's easier to care for other people than it is to care for ourselves and also not yeah. having the tools really to, yeah. to care for ourselves. So I don't know much about a, the connection between ADHD and self-harm, but it seems like mm. it makes perfect sense, right? Mm. In terms of why, why that would be, you know, why, I think why any neurodivergent person in pain would go that route or, you know, would really, mm. 
I don't know what I'm trying to say. I, <laughs> I, it, it seems like it feels like it's making, it makes sense to me just in terms of, you know, some of the extreme behaviors that we all have encountered either, you know, in, in terms of self-soothing or, you know, ways yeah. in which we've had to manage that the deep feelings of sadness and, and loneliness that we had to deal with at very young ages. No, absolutely. And you know what, it, it, it's funny because it, during that time, it's not funny, but it was, I'm amused at it now because looking back, that's at that. <laughs> yeah, not then, but now no, but... I just want to interrupt you. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I we always do that. It's like, yeah. it's whatever we're talking about really, really like traumatic things, we laugh and I'm like, it's, it's a total coping mechanism. But anyway, I, yeah. I'm here so, for it. No, no, I totally get it. I hear that a lot. And then I'm like, but because you're, you know, in a better place, you know, so it's, it's, it's okay. Um, but yeah, so looking back at that with a different lens now, but, you know, back then in, in high school, it was, you know, Tumblr was such a big thing and, um, everyone was on it. And I think the most recurring thing was just seeing a lot of self harm and people writing about it. And I think obviously with us, it was just like, if we saw it, we, you know, we'd copy that. Um, and whether or not that mm. was how I, how I felt, but I felt like that, that was, I guess that was my only option because I didn't know how else to deal with it. Um, other than cry and, and, and just, you know, vent. But then at the end of that, it's like, what else can I do? It's still there. It's still so much emotion. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now it has sort of a, a nice ending to it in the, in the, you, your decision to cover some of your scars with a tattoo, which I love yeah. this story. Can you share it? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I was very, uh, very lucky and honored to have shared the story um, uh, with Christy and I knew who's pretty amazing. Um, she's a First Nations um, artist here in Australia. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, I reached out to this tattoo artist because he actually had this fundraiser going for um, Beyond Blue um, for a while. And he like one of my goals was to get a tattoo for a cause. I already have so many thanks to my impulsivity. Um, but I said, look, my next one has to be, <laughs> my next one has to be for a cause. Let's get one for a cause. And I've got about three, uh, for causes, but this one was specifically, um, to support mental health. And he had this running on um, Instagram and he said, you know, he was trying to share it and market it. And he was like, you know, I want to, um, his background was that he had, um, covered a lot of self-harm scars, um, back in Brazil, I believe. And, and then he came here to do more tattoo work and, um, he wanted to do the same. And he just said, like, why don't why don't I just support uh, mental health instead of, instead of, you know, getting those, that, that funds for myself, like it, well, who's it going to help? It's going to help these people. And I thought that was amazing. Um, and I actually reached out to him, but it was like the day before the actual fundraiser was about to start. And he only had like limited availabilities. I mean, tattoos take up time and, and, you know, he wanted only four people or three max, depending on how long those tattoos took and how big the scars were. So um, I pretty much reached out like, look, I've only got a couple, but it's like, I would love the hungry, very hungry kind of pillow tattoo. Um, and then lucky enough, the receptionist was like, yeah, you've got a spot, come in here tomorrow. We've got an interviewer coming in um, and, you know, they're going to interview you and let's do it. Um, but yeah, and then I remember like, you know, they pretty much said like, you know, why, why are you choosing like this? And I, I thought, well, you know, I'm constantly growing and, and, you know, and I don't know where I'll be, but, you know, I might not be a butterfly, but I, um, I'm definitely growing and I'm going to be learning. And it's also because of the childcare background and how much passion I do have there for the children and, and just how much my, it was my favorite book. I think my sister had um, bought me this book, um, as a young child and it's just, it's a great story. I enjoy it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It really is. And you know, it's funny cause, uh, I think about my children, I don't know if this is neurodivergent, but I assume mm -hmm. it must be though, but that, mm -hmm. that, you know, they wanted to read the same book over and over and yeah. over again. Maybe that's just a childhood thing. You should probably know better than I do. Yeah. <laughs> One of the books that my son was obsessed with was yeah. the very hungry caterpillar. Yeah. And, um, oh, that's such a sweet story. I love that. And, yeah. uh, I bet you're the kids you work with also are like, Oh, look, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a definite conversation starter. Um, I've been dragged to parents to to show the tattoo. Um, so um, no, it's it's been very sweet, and I get you know that that also encourages me to go like, well, I got this for this reason. Um, but yeah, it's actually kind of sad that because when I did get interviewed for this um, with um, uh, Christine, I knew, um, I actually walked out of that interview, and I looked up that 
Eric Carl, the um, the author of the book, had passed away um, mm. r- right off. And I was like, oh, it's kind of a great, like, um, honor to, to have it in, 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 like, in his memory almost. So it was, yeah, it was kind of bittersweet. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Um, so now you had also, so you've been working in childhood for, or, ch- or child, you've been working in <laughs> child care for quite a few years now. And did you notice, like, are, do you, you, I assume like many of us, you had kind of a, a stereotype of what ADHD looks like, um, that it was sort of a, a naughty little boy thing. Do you, do you look at your kids differently? Are you noticing signs or, you, you know, what is it, what are you seeing that you never saw before? Yeah, well, um, I left childcare recently, but it, it now is a recruiter. But they, but I just there's this one concurrent memory that I always look back on is that yeah, obviously seeing all the boys, the males, um, you know, running around and all that sort, and having it just so obvious. But then, you know, noticing that remembering all these parents coming to me and asking, how do I help my female child because there's so much happening there. I think she's mm-hmm. just. I think she's just being emotional. What do I do? And I remember these set of parents coming up to me and going, we've done every parenting course. We've done all, we've read all the books. What do we do? Um, and you know, back then I, I didn't have an answer because I let alone didn't even know what was happening with me. So, um, looking back at that was just, yeah, just now noticing, well, a lot of us don't even know how to, how to do it. Or even neurotypicals still don't know how to address that as well, especially if they don't know if they have it or not. And especially their children. So it was, um, yeah, it's, it makes it more obvious now, obviously noticing the signs in myself. Um, but still, I, I still sometimes fail to notice a lot of that, um, because it's not as obvious as males, of course. And yeah, of course, you know, as you know, it is uh, underdiagnosed, um, in women. And I think that still really does shock a lot of uh, my coworkers now when I do raise this with them. And, and it's funny because now, um, now hearing, like, you know, telling them all about this, they, um, they've asked me, like, they've asked me all these questions. And I remember hearing a conversation in the lunchroom, someone going, I think I've got ADHD, but they think they'd said it as a joke. And this other lady had said, why do you think you have it? You don't have it. And then I, I've made it like uh, kind of committed to myself to try to talk to this lady and just go, do you want to have a chat? <laughs> um, and just trying to help her and see how that goes. But sorry, I've gone on a tangent, but, um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's interesting now. Yeah. Looking at it. I know that's, that's the, that's the, um, reaction I have whenever somebody, whenever I'm talking about ADHD and somebody's like, that's ridiculous. Everybody's like that. And I'm like, maybe we, yeah. maybe we need to have a chat. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, so now you had also mentioned that your brother did some stimming and like, mm. have, uh, okay. I want to ask about your family members. Cause we do that. You know, once we're diagnosed, mm. we look over our whole family tree and oh, we're yeah. like, oh, yep, yep. You definitely <laughs> have it. You do. Um, but you know, you also mentioned some of the cultural stigma from mm. being from an Asian family, you're mm. Filipino, um, yeah. you know, what, is how did they react to the diagnosis? What has been, what has been some of that reaction? Um, yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting, but with, uh, well, thank God with my, my parents, they, I, I pretty much took them along with, with my, um, all my mental health and, and what I'd been going through. Um, cause I went through a, a, you know, sexual assault, um, when I was turning 20, I believe. And, um, I dealt with it in such a horrible way that it just, it pretty much registered as me moving out then coming back in because I didn't know how to explain to them. And, you know, I just had so much shame and, and, you know, then eventually just telling them cause I needed to. And, and then they, I pretty much told them like, you need to understand, I need to address this. And they were like, okay, because, you know, at, I was like at the risk of, you know, losing me. I don't, I don't want to not have a relationship with you. I want everything to be out in the open, but they're so used to just talking about surface level stuff that they were just like, okay, this is serious. Let's listen to you. Um, and they do. And I think with the diagnosis, they were pretty much like, okay, good. Like, you know, well, what, what's going to happen now? And I've, you know, told them I'm on medication and all this other stuff, but they pretty much have just welcomed it pretty well. Um, more than I, I would have imagined, which is, which is really good. Um, yeah, but I think I believe with my sister it was um, 
it was it was a good realization with her because I think it was even before my diagnosis that I was pointing out all the signs um, there for her. And I remember we were sitting in the back of the car, we were just talking, and she, we've got a bigger age gap, so she's got a child already, and um, you know she's looking at it from also a motherly lens, I'm sure. And and I told her like you know you know she tried to help me a lot during um, my teenage years because I you know it, it was a lot of anxiety there and. I always broke down to her. I remember she plucked me out of Sydney to fly me to Melbourne where she lives and just to be like, what do I need to do? Like, what's wrong? And, and, and I've just told her, I remember like, you remember that time you did that? It's because there's so much happening. I had no idea. And I think now it's obviously, pre I'm presenting it as it, it is AG, it's ADHD. Um, and she just, she went into a huge like realization and just went, oh my gosh, you're right. And then, you know, then we went into stories going like, you know, she said like, oh, I've got a coworker who's 26 and just got diagnosed. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I'm so glad, you know, you're, you're doing this, you're addressing it, you know? Um, but yeah. And then we also have a brother that we share and, and, um, like, I think, I mean, I think we're just assuming cause, um, I don't, I don't think he'll ever really get assessed or neither will my nephew, but, um, we, we definitely think there might be something there. Um, obviously with the hair, hair curling and, um, and the like, but you know, it's, I think, I believe I've heard my dad always go, well, that's, that's his mum's side of, of, of things. And I'm like, well, would that mean that would present in everyone? Like, like, is that autistic trait there? Or like, hello, like, you know, and you know what they say, it's like, if that's the normal, then, then you probably got it. Um, so yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's been really amazing because with this whole cultural, yeah, being, you know, Filipino and, and growing up in Sydney, um, it's actually helped, um, my family in Philippines. Cause I had to go back during, uh, just before COVID. And at that point, my cousin had just, uh, had just had a baby, a baby boy. And I think she, he was around one or two at that time. And he, she was really struggling and she didn't have an answer to it. And I remember just like observing him for a few hours and, and just going, I, I think you need to get him assessed. Um, look, I'm like, and I'm not sure if that exists here, especially with such a backwards country in Philippines and then with all that stigma there, but they, but she was like, I don't know what you mean. I said, just, just give it a shot, find a doctor, tell them what your, your struggles are and tell them that you, you know, you want your son to get assessed. And I remember coming back to Sydney, um, and she, and the next day she had called my parents cause I was at work and she was bawling. She was crying. Um, I don't know whether it's from happiness, but I knew it was from sadness for sure because of how she interpreted mental health. Um, but she pretty much said, uh, like my son has a diagnosis of autism and we're putting him in specialist schools. Um, and yeah, and then my, you know, my parents told me the information and, and I remember messaging my cousin and going like, I, I want you to be like, I, I want you to know that, that, that I will like, that was great what you did. And I just want you to know, like, you're doing really well for your son. Like if you hadn't done it, it would have been a great, dis greater disservice for him. Um, and I'm grateful that you're, you know, you're chasing this thread so that you can help him and help yourself. Um, so that's been really eye opening for my family there because before they just ignore that stuff, they just play it off. Like, oh, that's just your behavior. Like that's just who you are. And I'm like, well, no, like if that's, if you're going to suffer the consequences, you've got to address what's really happening and, you know, it, it, you just got to do it. And they, um, now they're very, very open to all that stuff and they like to listen. Um, they might not put in input or, or say anything, but they're a lot open to just be more mindful of what they say and hearing about it. So it, it's, it's been great. Oh, that's so sweet. I'm getting very emotional <laughs> thinking about that. Um, because, you know, I do oh. like as a parent, I understand mm. that need, you know, it comes from such a place of love and protection mm. when um. we want, when, but at the same time, like also feeling the ex external shame, right? Of like, oh, mm. how are, you know, and I felt it with both my kids, even with their ADHD diagnosis yeah. or, you know, or, or my son who, you know, he loves to wear nail polish and he loves the color yeah. pink. And so there's always that part of me that I'm like, I accept him wholeheartedly. But when of he course. wears pink to school, I'm like, do you really want to yeah. do that? You know, like I, you know, and so there's yeah. always that it's coming from a place of love and protection, but mm. it's so denying his essence. And, and yeah. Yeah, I don't know, I just, I, <laughs> I, it's, I think it's very brave of parents who, mm -hmm. um, you know, once they do have that diagnosis, it puts you in that place of, of advocacy. And mm. it's just, you know, brings us to start 
spreading awareness, right? And for our own benefits and for the benefits of our kids. I think um, so many women, so many older women come to that, come to their diagnosis after like hardcore, hyper-focused advocacy for their children. <laughs> and then That's being like, huh, I, I share all of these traits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What, I, I feel like I'm getting bungled up again. I don't know. I'm not making any sense, but um, you know, I, I feel, I just feel so much, um, I just feel very tender toward toward that mom. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally and understand. It sounds like your parents are great. Yeah. They are. Yeah, I think. Um, but that's I totally understand. Like I, I, I respect all that because, yeah, you're right. Like, you know, seeing that as a, as an educator, I, I, it was so hard to give that information to parents and just saying because you know a lot of them would have reached you know five years old and and. And these parents, you know, just go, oh, that's just how this child is. And now, you know, I've just had this child the way they are. And, you know, I always had to, you know, talk to my, you know, my manager and anyone there. I'd just be like, you know, how do I approach this? And they didn't want to. And it was just so like, it was so, it was so upsetting. Cause I'm like, we're doing such a great disservice to these parents and these families. Like, yes, it's horrible. It's like, you don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but you also want to help. And whether that's you getting the receiving end of a shouting match because they don't think that whatever their you know, child is, but it was always my duty. I always wanted to do that. So there was this, I've had multiple converse, hard conversations with parents because, you know, it is, it's not really your place, but at the end of the day, it is, it's in your best interest. It is the best interest of that child. Um, they're the priority. And I remember having all these conversations with um, this specific, um, specific set of parents and they were very against it because apparently what they had done, uh, they'd moved their child from another childcare center two hours because educators there had told them that their child was autistic and, and they were threatening to do the same. When I had told them, I said, look, I, I think that your child is presenting qualities in autism. You know, I didn't go like your child has autism. It was more like, you know, you know, at a more approachable way and in a more open-minded way, just to open that conversation. And they were like, no, I don't think so. And walked away. And I remember they had talked to the, sir, the director and said like, well, you know, that we're not, they're, they're not going to be here for a couple of days and they'll come back. And they did come back. Um, and they said, you know, we just want to be honest with you. We moved for this reason, but what do you think? Like, why, why do you say that? And then it just, it became a great um, thing to talk about. And then eventually they got a diagnosis. So, you know, it, it can happen both ways. It can be that you lose a family because they don't want to face it or they, they don't believe it. Um, or you, you do have a family, you have a family and it does get emotional. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there are, there are two sides and it, it's, it's still very inspiring from, from yet, yeah, whether you are advocating for it and you also get a diagnosis, but also just, trying to help others. And it's, it's, a, it's a very inspiring thing what you do, Katie. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I know. And I, I can see from their point of view, right, that mm. a lot of the time, any learning disability feels, no, I, I, I think the stigma around ADHD is the fact that it's so often presented as a discipline issue, right? And so mm. the parent is thinking, if you're telling their kid that, mm. if you're telling them that their kid has, might have ADHD, they're hearing, you're telling me I'm a bad parent who can't, mm. you know, control my kid. And so it's when they come from that place of defensiveness, I think it, it's such a, it, it, become so complicated because they're like, you know, how many times have those kids gone home and then their parents are like, all right, you have to study harder or even yeah. worse, you know, punish them uh, yeah. for, for their behaviors. And then you just get stuck in that hamster wheel of, of shame and, uh, you know, try harder. And then the kid yeah. being like, I am, I am. Yeah. And, and it destroys their self-concept and it's, oh, oh God, I'm yeah. getting... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I'm so swept up in so many multiple thought processes right now, um, which is no, nothing new for me. Anyway, I'm gonna, <laughs> I also wanted to ask you about your husband because you're a military Ooh. spouse, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, and so I secretly, I don't know if I've talked about this much on the, I think, feel like I may have mentioned this once on the podcast before, but I always <laughs> wanted to join the military and I, I never did. I, but it was so appealing to me. And so I secretly think there are a lot that the military is filled with autistics and ADHDers because there's so much 
structure and so much rigor, mm. right? And yeah. activity. And it's just like perfect for our brains. So yeah. do you think he might be neurodivergent? Have <laughs> This is such a great question. I'm so glad you brought this up. It's so funny because I know for a fact my, my, like his brother, so my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law will listen to this and they're just going to be like, yeah. <laughs> um, because we, yeah, I mean, because we've, um, obviously we, we know that, um, my, uh, so my husband's brother, um, our nephew, uh, from him, um, he's diagnosed, diagnosed, um, he's got autism, um, and they've helped him so well. Um, through that process so but they you know then they realize well and this genetic. is the same sister-in-law who <laughs> yeah who was helped. talking to yeah. you about adhd too, yeah. right? okay all right yeah awesome. so she actually helped um like her now stepson um through that because when they'd met uh, when my brother-in-law and her met there was no like, there was nothing there and, it, and she just kind of looked at this child and was like okay we need to get help <laughs> um so it's been quite an interesting journey with her helping us through all this because she's like, you all had something. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, it's just, she's the answer to it. She's great. But she's yeah, pretty much like, you know, it's genetic. You all have it. Like, let's all just trace this back. What's going on? But no, I definitely think, like, I, I definitely think my husband has, has something because I, I definitely think it's autism. Um, but I... Like he even said a couple of years back, he's like, I think I've got it. And I remember going, how dare you say that? And I think it was because I was like, I don't know what I had. And like, it was just, I, it was just so much emotion. And, but now going, yeah, you've got something. Like you just love, <laughs> you know, you love the rigor and you love structure. And I'm here like, I need to be flexible. Like, you know, and, and I remember seeing this post the other day. Sorry, I'm going tangent. I'm going off on a tangent. But I'm seeing this post the other day, like an autistic person sees an ADHD person and they go, they tell the ADHD person, oh, you're like me, but fast. Um, <laughs> um, and, but it's, it's been such a journey with it because I, I like, I now obviously with this lens, just enjoying watching all the tidbits and all the stuff that we have that mesh well together and then the stuff that we have to you know learn and try to mix together so no definitely he definitely has something because you know and we're still waiting for this but i think he's just had so many well strategies around him that he he doesn't need it because he's just kind of like well you know it is not suffering but at, at the end of that also he, he is going through like at the moment to address a lot of his trauma um, and we actually did have, have a great conversation about this the other day. It was more like, I think you brought this up with um, Dr. Kelly, if I believe. It was about, you know, if trauma really is why we have this and, and, and it's exacerbated, but, you know, um, by all that. Because I remember my um, my psychiatrist saying, well, you know, your trauma exacerbated your ADHD and, uh, and me just sitting there going, then everyone's got it, you know? And I mean, <laughs> it's just... A huge thing, but sorry, no, I've gone on a tangent, but definitely, yeah, I, yeah, he's, we're all looking at him and, and point, pointing out the signs. So it's, it's, it's there. <laughs> right. Well, and I think it's also, you know, why I so often, um, gravitate toward the term neurodivergent because I feel like mm. there's like, we have a certain wiring and yes. then depending on, our upbringing, our experiences, the, all of the trauma that mm. everybody experiences as a neurodivergent, all of those mm. micro traumas we're constantly receiving, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you throw in a major event like, a, yeah. you know, a sexual assault or just, mm. you know, a, a pandemic or all of these things mm. like then it becomes, you know, those become catalysts for the ADHD behavior. Um, yeah. but I don't know, I'm still trying to figure it out. And every time I, <laughs> you know, every time I sit down with a psychologist or a psychiatrist, I'm like, let's figure this out right now. And they're like, we don't, we're not, we're not, that's never going to happen. <laughs> like, I feel like, I mean, uh, I'll spend, I'll spend the rest of my days trying to like pinpoint. It's really yeah. important to me to understand this thoroughly. And I'm like, yeah. oh my God, yeah. that is so neurodivergent to like obsessively want to find the answers. So yeah. No, I, um, I, yeah, yeah, I, but I, I know I, I'm the same way with my husband. I, I think he, I'm like, most of the time, you know, when I was first diagnosed, I was like, oh, he's so neurotypical because he mm. does all the things I can't do. We're such a mm. good pairing. Mm. Um, but now over the years, as I've learned more and more, I'm like, well, you're definitely something <laughs> like, 
<laughs> you uh, you know, I'm like I feel it. I, I feel like he's definitely neuro spicy or somewhere he's somewhere on the spectrum. Because right, like I'm just like it's there's just too much. There's too yeah. much. Um, he's very you know, and and I was uh, I was listening to actually the Neurodivergent Woman podcast. Do you oh, know yeah. that one? I'm like obsessed just, with it right now. I'm yeah. binging. I'm binging all their episodes. I love that podcast. And they were there was something that they were talking about. Oh, am I gonna not have it? Oh, there was something they were talking about with in terms of autism where mm. the, a trait of um oh crap uh i'm not gonna remember okay. what it was oh well if it comes back to me i'll tell you but there was something where it was like my husband to a t mm. uh and i was like oh now i'm gonna be going down this rabbit hole again <laughs> yeah no i i totally resonate with all of that i love the term um what was it neuro spicy it's it's, that's amazing. I love that. I feel like I need to put that on my resume or something. Like that's such a great term. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to call my husband that too. I, I definitely. But right. it's it's so true because you you know you're going through this whole diagnosis and you're and you're learning so much about yourself that not only does this diagnosis help you, it helps others because you're like, well, if you've got that and I have that, hmm, what's happening? <laughs> Um, but no, I honestly, yeah, I honestly thought like, well, yeah, he's definitely, my husband's definitely neurotypical. Hang on. Why are you like this? Why do you like buying all these things? Why? Like, it's just like, he's got a huge hyperfixation over like typewriters so much so that I had to, I put that in my vows because I'm like, that's something there that I'm telling you, you've got neurospicy. Like, it's just, yeah. But, um, and right? I, just, I know, yeah. <laughs> but hearing that now or never. It's, it's so, it was so funny because that's something I definitely did not realize till as of late, because my husband very early on when we were dating, he was like, you know, you always have to do something now or never. Why is that? And I'm like, I don't know, but I have to do it now. Like, and it's just, yeah, I, it's just still no answer, but it's just like, well, if I don't have it now, I'm, I'm not going to be happy, I guess. And, and he's like, and he's gotten so used to that now. I was like, okay, well, it has to be now. Let's, let's go do what we need to do. Right. And um but but yeah it's just such a learning thing for both of us to just go okay what works for both of us how are we going to address this we'll just have to do it like let's just see how it goes and test it you know right yeah well and that's what i'm always talking about with with my coaching clients like this mm. is really about information and, and it's mm. really about figuring out how to sort through the chaos and and what is yeah. the best way to approach the system but to take ourselves and our emotions out of it and say i am not the problem like i am you know mm. we so quickly go to that place of of you know what's wrong with me i can't do this what i'm i'm the problem as opposed mm. to always saying like no that is a red flag we need to like this is all about learning how best to understand each other yeah. and ourselves and then being able to then you know um uh, change, you know, change our methods and figure out what works for us. Like it's, it's really kind of that simple. Uh, mm. And I just remembered what it was. <laughs> they said oh, good. The yes, tell me, tell me. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go on a tangent. So yeah. they were talking about how, okay. So they, they, they like to talk a lot about how we really love information and we really yeah. love, you know, dis like uh, conversations with neurodivergence tend to be around what we're interested in and like really fascinating mm. topics. We hate small talk. And a lot mm. of small talk is like, is like thoughtful talk, like how is your family mm. and what's going on and did, how was that surgery? Like we forget all that stuff. We forget mm. the details, but we really, really want to talk about like, you know, things, you know, something that we're super into these days, right? And so mm. that's one of the things. My husband is an introvert and he's very mm. uncomfortable with small talk. And so mm. he has like a, he has like, like, like uh, specific questions that he goes to, like almost like in his vault. Uh, and one of the questions he'll always ask people is, yeah. what are you reading these days? Because he just feels like it gets them to open up and it gets people talking yeah. um, so that he doesn't have to. But it's also usually really interesting. And so yeah. it's his favorite, like, small talk, yeah. not small talk question that he always does. And they specifically were talking about all that on the podcast. It's like <laughs> autistics ask each other what they're reading all the time. And I was like, oh, oh my God. okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's so funny that you say that. I just, it's like, you're saying this and I'm like, are we sharing the same husband? What is this? Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. No, but yeah, he, he always have, like, has a great question up his sleeve. Like, it's so true. 
we we love skipping small talk, but it's like, yeah, hey, what are you into these days? What what you, what's your like? I think he he really impressed my brother-in-law um, by asking him like something like, you know, what's the weirdest trick that you know, or or like something that you don't share with everyone, and then. And like, you know, after that impression, my sister told me like, you know, he really charmed, uh, you know, my husband. It's amazing. <laughs> He's a great person. I'm like, okay. But now seeing that it's like, okay, he didn't just want to get to know someone. That was just him. Like that, that's just, he wanted to, you know, yeah, skip everything. Right? It's and just, like, I just want, <laughs> I just want to get the other person talking, but it's true. Like, yeah. I feel like I wish I could have those, those packs of cards that are like the really yeah. interesting, you know, dinner conversation cards. Like I want to have yeah. those on me at all times. Cause that's the, those are the, that's the meaty stuff. Oh, yeah. Seriously. Like conversation <laughs> um, starters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know. Um, okay. So, so what would you say you love most about your ADHD? Oh yeah. I was just thinking about that. It was the, um, <laughs> you, know, you hear this a lot, you know, on, on the podcast and everywhere. It's like how entrepreneurial we, we all become and, mm. and how many side hustles we've gone through and how creative we've gone. Yeah. And like, I can, you know, it's just, it's true. And like, I never had a, it's something to, to base that off of. And now knowing that it was hyper fixations and, and how creative I actually am and just using that creativity in different outlets and, yeah, but no, that's that's a big thing. I thoroughly enjoy that about myself and realizing the past few days just how like driven I really am and how much high energy. Um, oh my gosh, during um, our reception, we have the video, but all my cousins, all my friends have just kept, kept saying, you know, Ray is so loud. And I'm like, that's ADHD. Like, <laughs> like she's so awake <laughs> in the morning. That's ADHD. Like, it's just... They pretty much diagnosed, diagnosed me and shared that diagnosis before I even got it the week after. And it was just so funny, like seeing all this. And I'm like, yeah, you guys realize you, you're related to an ADHD person. You're friends with an ADHD, you know, and it's just, but it's so good that they see that in such a positive light because um, like, I enjoy that because I'm like, well, if you enjoy it, great. That's a good thing for everyone, you know, cause I'm always like that. And, um, but yeah, I think uh, I do love that about me because, you know, yeah, we, we, we have so many thoughts that there are just new things coming up. I feel like I have to have a notebook anywhere I go. Um, but I actually thought about this driving the other day, like, okay, why don't we like develop an app that we can just be like, Hey, can you write this note down? Because I have an idea for a new app that I probably never make, but I've got a great idea. I can pitch to someone, <laughs> um, you know, it's a, yes, an endless, <laughs> endless stream of, of all that. And just, yeah, just, I don't know. Being right. Great multi yeah. The endless, the endless, the <laughs> endless like brain dump um, to do list yeah. of of ideas or something. Yeah, I think that's really common with a lot of us. In fact, my father, who has never been diagnosed with anything, but I'm fairly sure is autistic and has yeah. ADHD, um, but he always had he always had a, a little like notepad that he would carry with him, yeah. and every time he met a new person, he would start a new chapter and 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 he would write them down. And he, whenever they oh, would nice. bring up something interesting, a personal detail about themselves, he would write it down. Like, oh, they really like, you know strawberry iced tea or, or ice cream or, you know, like he, he would write wow. down these details so that he could remember these things about people. Yeah. And I'm like, it's so weird and fascinating to me because it was like, he, you could see how he had such terrible working memory that he was like yes. trying to hold on to yeah. details about people, but also trying to like be thoughtful because that mm. wasn't something that felt like it came naturally to him. But then at the same time, also like cataloging all of yeah. this information about people just was like, <laughs> what are you doing? It's so weird. And now I'm like, oh, it all yeah. makes so much sense. Yeah. But and yeah. when I was a teenager, it was so embarrassing because uh, my father was always pulling out his notebook with my friends yeah. and being like, oh, oh. so your food, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> Right. And I was like, you're so creepy. But now I'm like, oh, it makes so much sense. Yeah. yeah that's, that's so sweet. But yeah, but like, yeah, like seeing it from a you know neurotypical lens, you're like, oh, that's very thoughtful. Like he's just writing it down. So he knows, you know, if he wants to get a gift, that's what he'll get. But then looking at through this lens, it's like, no, no, he's just having a hard time. This is how he's coping. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Right? And just, yeah. well, and just knowing that, you know, like so many of us, I think so many people who are diagnosed well, 
into adulthood, you know, mm. they've been Googling things like, do mm. I have early Alzheimer's because our memory is so <laughs> terrible. There I am laughing about Alzheimer's, ha ha ha. But like, you know, um, <laughs> but like, you know, the idea of, of how working memory plays into neurodivergence and, and mm. the ways in which we've tried to like intuitively hold on to yeah. ideas and, and uh, keep them yeah. because every one of them feels so amazing and urgent and uh, they all just like... <laughs> fly away that's right it's just yeah i it, it's funny because um, my husband is also now started bringing around a notebook um but to jot his thoughts down and um and i'm like well what else does he write in there <laughs> um so yeah so, <laughs> who knows we'll figure it out <laughs> wait so wait do you want him to listen to this episode or no <laughs> No, I would, I would love him to. I think he, he, he knows like how much oh. I enjoy advocating, um, for a lot of things. And I think, uh, yeah, like it's a no brainer. A lot of my family will listen to this, which is also good. Cause I've, I've haven't been silent about it. Like they've been through this with me. Like a lot of my cousins, uh, listen, uh, like, you know, follow along, uh, you know, and my best friend too. And it's, it's been really encouraging and supportive. So I think, yeah, it's, it's good to be surrounded by a good support network for sure. <laughs> Aw, that's really sweet. Um, mm. I think, you know, and it's one of those things like there's been some backlash recently about mm. ADHD content on TikTok and mm. how there's so many, there, I mean, there's so many creators on TikTok mm. who are talking about ADHD, which doesn't surprise me because everybody on that app is neurodivergent because we're like moths to a flame with that app. Mm. It's just yeah. like insane dopamine. Um, yeah. But, you know, that there's been, I've, I've heard criticism about people talking about like how creators will only are only portraying ADHD as this like weird, quirky, hilarious thing. And, Oh, mm. look at me. I bump into things. And, <sighs> um, you know, they're not really able to really show how deeply our self worth is, is affected by yeah. being neurodivergent and that there's a real, real struggle there. And how do you articulate that duality? It's really, really difficult to articulate. And so why yeah. I think these conversations are so healing is yeah. we are able to really show, even though we talk about trauma and laugh, like <laughs> we're showing how <laughs> deeply complex our relationship is with ADHD and ourselves and all of it. Yeah. And so I yeah. think, you know, when uh, there's something, I feel like that's how, you know, rather than saying to your family members, I have ADHD, it's like, mm. there's so much behind that because <laughs> you don't yeah. know what they're thinking. They don't, you don't know what their knowledge is of ADHD. So it's like, no, you have to like, I have to explain everything. <laughs> no, and, yeah, um, that's right. Right. That's, yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny because when I did tell them it was like through a FaceTime and it was, you know, um, just doing that. And I was like, look, I, you know, I do have it. And then they were like, Oh, like, yeah, well, you know, and, and they didn't know yet what to say, but they were just like, help us understand it. Like what, like they were pretty much facing the question off of why I would take medication. And I said, well, picture yourself mm. going to a concert, um, and you're in the mosh pit, everything is just happening. And that's me no, no, with no medication. And they're like, okay. And I was like, and then when you go home and you're all calm, and your ears are pretty much leveled out and they're all good and like there's no sound that's me on meds and they were pretty much like oh my god that's a really good analogy and that is a really good analogy yeah, but yeah and like because i'm like i knew that they would um resonate with that because they would totally understand that that you know the difference and how they would feel in those both those moments in a neurotypical way and I think I also was like, oh, it was a good, it was a good analogy. Like, thank you. I didn't know that. And they, <laughs> they were just like, yeah. It's like, they're like, okay, so that's why this is, you know, and, and like, that's why you are you. And I'm like, there's a lot more than that, but sure. Like, you know, like we can just start there and then we'll dig deeper. So, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. Until next time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I like that analogy. Uh, yeah, I'll have to thank you. I'll have to remember that one. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So I have to ask if you could rename ADHD, would you, would, do you have another name you could give it? Yeah. You know, this one really struggled. I, I struggled with this question because I'm like, there's so much. I remember hearing. I don't very have early, one. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's great that you asked. Cause it's like, <laughs> it's like, it prompts everyone to think like, well, that's hard, you know? Um, but I, I heard one earlier in, in your, uh, in your podcast, uh, someone had said it was like an, the energizer 
uh, the bunny as an energizer bunny. I love that one a lot, but I think I would, I would probably name it. Um, it's probably like with just dopamine seeker. Like, I mean, isn't everybody though, but then that, that would, that wouldn't obviously set us apart, but it's just that we're just, we just need more of it, you know, cause we're lacking it. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something cause I'm like, I never really point out that I need dopamine until someone goes, oh, you're shopping again. It's like, oh, you're, you're doing this. Oh, you're, you've got, you got more strawberries. Oh, it's like, oh yeah, I'm trying to get happy again. Like, <laughs> you know, and it, yeah, it's not until <laughs> someone points it out. So <laughs> yeah. Mm. I kind of like mosh pit syndrome. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so much better. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I love that. Um, I, I, I do remember reading someone saying something like we're, we're sim characters. Like, you know how we play Sims mm. and you're, you've got those actions lined up, but then you're in a room and you've just forgotten everything. And, and then, yeah, you're a Sim. <laughs> like it just, yeah, it, it's, I found that funny too. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I definitely love mosh pit syndrome. I think I'll, uh. I'll put that on somewhere. <laughs> Well, Ray, I, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your story and your diagnosis and um, your awesome family members. And <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. It's been such an honor listening to you and, and everyone on this podcast. It's made me feel less alone and you guys are also inspiring. And thank you for giving um, myself and others a voice to this community. Oh, thank you.